So thanks, Manu, again, for inviting me to this really excellent talk series um, and, well, giving me the opportunity to basically speak about one of my favorite topics, but also one that I think is very important when we talk about sleep and circadian health, and that is sleep regularity. And I want to touch on metrics, mechanisms, and some light, very light modeling. Um, so I'll start with an introduction. I'll um, go into what is sleep regularity, why would we care, and what do we know about it so far. Then I'll move to how we can measure the concept. Are there differences between the available metrics? And when are these metrics best suited under which circumstances? Then I'll touch briefly on the mechanisms. Why is sleep regularity such a good predictor? And what about regularity in other rhythms, rhythms other than sleep? And I'll end with an outlook. So based on all of this, where will we go next? Where are promising avenues also for you to get engaged? Okay, so what is sleep regularity? What you see here is a typical raster blot. You have the days on the y-axis, the time of day on the x-axis, so that each row basically presents one day, and we have sleep in black bars and then uh, work in blue. So this person goes to sleep at 11 p.m., wakes up at 7 a.m. in the morning. But of course, this is not a real person. This is uh, an example, simulated perfectly regular sleep-wake patterns. So that means identical sleep onsets and offsets every day. But no one sleeps like this, probably for a good reason. What is more real life is something like this, where we have some variation in sleep onset, usually more than in sleep offset, but what we usually see is that people sleep longer and later on their weekends or their days off. So you can, I mean, you probably have an intuitive understanding of regular or irregular sleep. So we really mean this variability from one day to the next. Why is it important? Why would you even care about that? And here I want to quote uh, Andrew Phillips. Uh, he's an associate professor at Monash University in Australia. And I want to I want to say he's the founding father of modern sleep regularity research, but I'm sure he won't like it. So let's just agree he's one of the leading researchers into sleep regularity. And he opened his talk last uh, World Sleep Conference saying, Sleep regularity is more important to health than sleep duration. I might be wrong about this, but I don't think so. So it's really, of course, a bold statement, but not very surprisingly, I think he's onto something. And if so, this would represent a major shift in our understanding of what healthy sleep is, not just adequate duration so that you get a sufficient number of hours every day, but also regular timing of sleep is critical to health and performance. And that would really be a major paradigm shift. So what motivates him to say that? There are more and more studies uh, looking at sleep regularity, finding that it's a very good predictor of a wide range of outcomes. But importantly, it's often a better predictor than average sleep duration. So that's a recent example, uh, also from Andrew Phillips Group, led by one of his PhD students, Dan Windred. And they used data from the UK Biobank, more than 60,000 people. And they um, looked at sleep, at the baseline measurement. And so you can look at regularity of sleep, the duration, the efficiency, which is sort of a measure for sleep quality. And then the UK Biobank follows these people over several years, up to almost eight years. And they um, register if people died during that period from any cause. So that would give you the risk for an all-cause mortality. And then you look if sleep at baseline has anything to do with this mortality risk. And they found that your all-cause mortality risk was reduced by 18.7% with every one standard deviation increase in sleep regularity. So in other words, the more regular your sleep is, the lower your mortality risk. And they also found that duration efficiency are significant predictors, but to a much lesser extent. So really sleep regularity was the strongest predictor for your mortality risk. And I think that's, those are quite impressive numbers. What else do we know about sleep regularity? 
Um, well, there's quite a bit of research out there, but it's still an emerging field. So results for uh, sex differences are still inconclusive. Same goes for race, not really sure which way we're leaning here. For age, we usually find that younger people are on average more irregular sleepers. We find, well, not very surprisingly for childbearing, variability in sleep goes uh, through the roof first week after giving birth. Quite well documented is that a later chronotype is associated with more irregular sleep wake behavior. And we find that for light exposure, the more irregular sleep, the more irregular the light exposure. It is also associated with, as I said before, quite a wide range of health outcomes, um, but the evidence is most consolidated for cardiometabolic health, hypertension, blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, and also for mental health. And that includes depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, mood, well-being, uh, and more recently, all cause mortality. So really it associates with a lot, but the reason we still find, or I mean, part of the reasons we might still see um, some inconclusive results, but it goes, it really goes for any kind of research. We um, need to agree on how we measure the concept because depending on that, we might get different results for the same research question. So I wanna spend quite a bit of time on um, these metrics. So how can we actually assess sleep regularity? And here you see the sleep wake pattern that I showed you before with uh, sleep on work days and on free days and some you know, work schedule. And we can quantify the pattern and calculate sleep duration on average, on work days, on work free days. Can do the same for the timing of sleep, right? Work days, free days, we can come up with a measure for chronotype. So if you're more of a morning person or a late person, Mm, but um, we could, so let me just do something to this pattern. We could simply um, change this pattern by cutting off one hour on Mondays and add it to sleep on Tuesdays and do the same on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So we kind of just cut off one hour, add it to the next day. And so we clearly change the pattern, but what we did not change are these, uh, these aspects. So duration is not affected, sleep timing is not affected, even though clearly something has changed. What that is, of course, is sleep regularity. Um, and there are metrics for that as well. One of them is a concept call, called social jet lag that measures the difference between your average mid-timing, mid-sleep timing on work days and the average mid-sleep timing on your weekends, your free days. Um, and it has not been developed for sleep regularity, but it's been used for that. It is also not affected by this slight intervention here because it looks at a weekly variation, at an overall variation between work days and non work days, and that changes at a weekly rhythm. So, to focus more on a daily variability, people have used standard deviation, right? So, you just take one aspect of your sleep wake pattern, the onset, the offset, duration, or in that case, the midpoint of sleep. So halfway through onset and offset. And you quantify the dispersion around the mean standard deviation. People have also used a concept that comes more from uh, the circadian field, and that is called interdaily stability. So strictly speaking, it's not uh, for sleep, it's based to, well, it's used to quantify um, stability of rest activity rhythms uh, based on actimetry. So the, like Fitbits you wear around your wrist that record physical activity. And what interdaily stability does, it takes each day, like the 24 hour pattern, and it compares it to the overall pattern, to the overall variability. So each day basically compared to the average. And that is something that both these metrics have in common. They deal with an average pattern, an overall idea, and they take that as a reference to quantify a variability. And that's also the reason why more recently two additional metrics have been proposed. And one of that is the sleep, regular, uh, sleep regularity index, the SRI. And that's been developed by Andrew Phillips in 2017. 
So what the SRI does, it takes um, also one full day, 24 hours of data. But instead of comparing it to the overall pattern, like interday stability does, it compares it to the next day. And then that day to the next and so on. So we compare day one with day two, day two with day three, and we do that for the entire time series. And then that is integrated into one score and scaled such that we have SRI scores between zero. That's a random pattern, no way to predict what sleep's gonna be like the next day to 100, which would be a perfectly regular pattern. And then there's composite phase deviation metric, the CPD. And that's been developed by myself when I was a PhD student with Till Ronneberg and Celine Fetter. And uh, composite phase deviation is a mix of standard deviation and the SRI. So what it does is it calculates two difference values. So one is sort of an alignment component. We uh, calculate how far away today's mid-sleep is um, how far away it is from the individual's chronotype, right? Where sleep would sort of naturally occur. It's an alignment, right? How far are you away from your optimal sleep timing? And then we have an irregularity component and that calculates the difference between one day and the next, right? So how much does mid-sleep timing move from one day to the next? And then we have two delta values and we plot them against each other that gives sort of a density plot. And then CPD is the vector length. So the distance of each day, each data point from the origin, and that would be a perfectly regular pattern. So what is the big difference? Why would we need new metrics? Uh, that can be, I think, quite um, easily be demonstrated. Um, we take the original time series. So that's the sleep-wake pattern that you've seen before. And we just randomly reorder it, right? We just scramble the sleep periods and throw them um, together. And so what we do change is the sequence, right? So how sleep um, occurs from day to day, what we do not change is the overall pattern, the average. And that means that these metrics, the traditional ones, standard deviation IS, they will not be affected. They will remain identical. But the novel metrics, CPD, SRI, they will return different scores because they really capture this day-to-day -day variation. And that has changed. So that's the first key difference that I want to make. Um, we can arrange these four metrics according to the time scale on which they measure. And standard deviation into daily stability, we call them overall metrics because they measure across multiple days on a global time scale. And the new ones, CPD and SRI, they measure from day to day, so on a circadian time scale. What if sleep is not consolidated. So if people take naps or they wake up during the night, so we have polyphasic sleep or sleep fragmentation. Um, and that's the second key difference. We can also group these metrics according to the way that they process the sleep-wake signal. And standard deviation and CPD are daily value metrics. They take a single aspect of sleep, such as sleep onset or duration, and they quantify a var variability in that single aspect. Whereas interdaily stability and the SRI, they characterize the entire sleep-wake pattern. They can pick up on any signal, right? If you have naps in there, if you have some wakefulness during the night, they pick up of, of, on all of the signal and they can integrate that. And so um, you could think, well, that's a no-brainer, then let's just use whole signal metrics. But it's both a strength and a weakness, because if you characterize everything, you can't really know where the variability that you're seeing stems from. And daily value metric can be used for that, right? If you quantify variability in sleep onset, then that's where, you, where, uh, where it comes from. So it's both a pro and a con. A question that is asked quite often how many number of, uh, like how many days of data would you need to reliably quantify sleep regularity? Is two enough or would you need weeks of, uh, of data, of recording? 
So we tried to answer that in a, uh, in a paper where we simulated sleep wake patterns and we varied the number of days that we care create sleep regularity from. So, you know, you have four weeks of data, you know the sort of actual regularity, and then you just pick, for example, seven days from it, and you calculate regularity for those seven days, or two days, or three days. I just want to show you the results for interdaily stability and the SRI. So the SRI, down here you have the number of days that the SRI is based on, and the SRI is super stable, really impressively accurate. Doesn't matter if you have two days or four weeks. Whereas the interdaily stability really changes a lot over these first seven days. And what it does, it overestimates sleep regularity. Meaning, if you just have seven or less days of data, you would think that this person is more regular than they actually are, which you have just measured for longer time. And that's the third key difference. So these overall metrics, standard deviation and interdaily stability, they um, are biased when they're based on seven days or less. But there's a trade-off. So CPD, SRI, they are more accurate, uh, but to make that um, possible, they require larger sample sizes, right? So either you have a lot of data, or you have large sample sizes. So you would need one or the other. And that brings us to the question, well, let's say if you are under the impression now that they all, the, all these metrics measure different things, then you are very right. They all do uh, access different aspects of sleep regularity. And it raises the question, well, when do we choose what metric? What is appropriate? So if you want to predict one outcome, then we recommend that you select one metric, depending on the type of data that you have and the study parameters. So if you have limited data, meaning, for example, you just ask your students to report their daily sleep duration, then we recommend using daily value metrics, right? Because they can deal with that. That's all they need. If you have more full sleep diaries or actimetry data, then you would ask, um, do I have fragmentation in the data? Like a lot of naps, a lot of um, wake after sleep onset. And if that's not the case, then you are free to basically choose whatever metric you like with a slight preference for these more novel metrics because they measure on a circadian time scale. But if there is a lot of fragmentation, then we recommend whole signal metrics like the SRI because they can pick up on that. And then importantly, your study parameters. Do you have just a week of data or less? Uh, then we ask, what is your sample size? Is it small? If that's the case, well, then really all metrics are limited. There's not much you can do. That's the bare minimum. You need a bit of data and a bit of people. If it's large, um, even though you don't have a lot of data, but you have quite a number of people, then you can use the consecutive metrics. They will still return quite an accurate estimate. Uh, it looks different if you have more than one week of recording and you have a large sample size, pick whatever you like, slight reference for CPD and SRI. And um, if the sample size is small, however, then you would choose standard deviation or interdaily stability because they um, can still quite reliably estimate sleep regularity, even uh, with a small sample size. All right. Could be that you are not satisfied with that and you want to learn more about the mechanism. So not just if sleep regularity is associated with health, but why. And then we recommend that you select more than one metric, right? Because they all measure different aspects, you can make use of that and combine them in a way that give you answers. So if you want to know if your effects are driven by sleep fragmentation, combine a daily value with a whole signal metric. If you want to know if it's a daily versus a weekly variation, you can include social jet lag to answer that. Or, and that is one of the questions that we most often ask, are these effects because we have circadian disruption? And because the metrics measure on different timescales, 
uh, you can combine an overall matrix, so one of the old ones, with one of the new ones, the SRI, for example, and compare them. And that brings me to the next big part. So circadian disruption is really why we think sleep regularity is such a good predictor. So um, you can imagine that having a difference, like a shift in sleep from day to day, can either disrupt the circadian clock or be reflective of a disrupted circadian system. But in addition to that, sleep regularity is um, also sort of also captures or goes hand in hand with variability in a lot of other rhythms. So it's not hard to imagine if you sleep at irregular hours, then you probably also eat at irregular hours and you have you exercise at different time, times and you also awake and asleep at different times, which means you get different light exposure. And so sleep regularity might capture a variability in so many other rhythms that all can on their own disrupt the circadian clock that we have this huge conglomerate of adverse effects. And then it's no surprise that we find a lot of associations with different health outcomes. So that's the assumed idea. It also makes it hard to really pinpoint where exactly the effect comes from. If you think about interventions, right? Well, how can we decrease health risks? Do we need to change lights? Do we need to send people outdoors? Or is it just a matter of when you eat or sleep? So that's really an open question and um, worthwhile getting into and, um, and study more. Well, if we think that many, many other rhythms are also irregular when we look at irregular sleep, question is, in order to study them, can we use the metrics that we already have and just apply them to the other outcomes and then, you know, make use of that? The, the answer is yes. It might not be super straightforward, but it can be done. And it's easier with a daily value metric, such as composite phase deviation, because all you need is one measurement per day. And that's been done, for example, for meal timing. So that's the graphical abstract from Lian Wang, sorry, that came out last year, Nutrients. And they basically collected the time of the first eating occasion um, in a young uh, sample and the time of the last eating occasion. And to that, you can apply CPD, and you can quantify a variability in the meal timing from day to day. And not very surprisingly, but it's still super important, they find a high to a very high variability in, uh, in eating patterns. CBD has also been applied to light exposure. I'll come to that uh, a bit later. That's been done by my own group. And it's been applied to social schedules. And that was published in Sleep in 2020. There we had a sample of college students, around 200, and they reported their sleep weight behavior for a period of approximately 30 days. They also reported their daily well being, so how stressed or sad or alert they felt each day. And they reported the timing of the first scheduled event for every day. And to that, we can apply CPD for sleep, as we uh, well, did before. We can also apply it to um, the event schedule, right? So we can, um, for one, calculate how far away today's timing of the event is um, from the average event timing. So there would be an alignment. And we can quantify, uh, quantify how much these events move, right? Their timing moves from day to day. And so the idea was to look uh, whether, for example, irregular social schedules would drive irregular sleep if the one would go hand in hand with the other. And that was uh, actually not the case. So what we found is uh, was all possible combinations for groups. So we had students with regular sleep and regular event schedules. We had um, ones with irregular sleep, but regular schedules and so on. So all the combinations. But when you looked at their well-being, then we found that the ones, the students who had irregular sleep and irregular schedules, 
they were the ones who reported to poorest well-being, so feeling least happy and most stressed. So it appeared that only irregular sleep was not sufficient to significantly decrease well-being, but in combination with an irregular uh, social schedule, that then um, really decreased well-being in that sample. We then also applied it to a light exposure that was in a sample of uh, 23 day workers. And there we recorded light continuously at eye level uh, for four uh, entire days. And we recorded it in three channels. So red light, green light, blue light. And we took the blue light channel because it's known that blue light affects the circadian clock um, um, the, the most. And we apply CPD as before to sleep. And we can also apply it to light and both the timing of the light exposure. So that would be uh, the acrophase, sort of a daily center of the light exposure. And also to the intensity. That means how much light um, people got during the study, during the day on average. And so here we did indeed find two groups. So for light, it was the case that if sleep was irregular, light was irregular and vice versa. So just two clusters. But of course, as you can uh, immediately see, these clusters are not mutually exclusive. So for example, we can have two individuals that are very different sleepers, one irregular, one regular, but their light exposure can be uh, quite similar. So we do have overlap, of course. So that was the result with regards to the timing. What about the intensity? So how much light people get on average across these four days? And was that level the same every day, right? Sort of a regularity in how much light you get. And here, in principle, three groups are possible. You can either not go outside, spend your days indoors, and then uh, you just don't get a lot of light, and that's the case every day. So that would be consistently low light exposure. Or you can spend all your days outdoors, get a lot of light all the time, and that would mean you have a consistently high light exposure. Or, well, maybe you, know, you work indoors, and then on the weekends you spend some hours outside, and so you get um, a lot of light sometimes, and that makes it inconsistently. Um, and that's, well, what we found is no one in our sample spent all their days outside. No one had a consistently high light exposure. Most people were uh, down here, what we termed in, uh, they lived in biological darkness with consistently low light levels. So basically they stayed inside. But some people, they did go outdoors on their weekends. So they got sort of the occasional light shower, on average, a lot of light, but not every day, just on the weekends. And when we now look into these clusters and look at how their sleep behavior, what their sleep behavior looks like, then we see that within the red clusters, so the ones who live in biological darkness, I, put, I say that very provocatively, um, in that group, we see everything, a wide range of sleep behavior, either long sleepers, short sleepers, we have regular sleepers or irregular ones. We have early, like, uh, early chronotypes, late ones, basically everything. If we look um, into the cluster that at least gets some light occasionally, then um, we have a trend towards sort of better outcomes. So towards longer sleep duration, towards more regular sleep and a later and a, a earlier chronotype. And so there are two ways that we interpret this preliminary data. One is if you, if there's like a strong signal from outside, a strong light input missing, that may allow other factors to shape sleep wake behavior, such as maybe physiology, right? Maybe there's a sensitivity to light that uh, can then, you know, nudge you towards one or the other direction. But, and that's the second idea that we, that we get from this, um, maybe just you know, getting some strong input from time to time, maybe that is enough to sort of um, stabilize sleep-wake behavior and, and move it towards better outcomes. Okay. Of course, Andrew didn't wait long to catch up 
uh, actually he's he's far ahead because this work is published came out in December last year and he developed a light regularity index reason because um they're still lacking. There are not uh, no good measures out there to quantify light regularity. And consequently, the relationship between sleep and light is underexplored. And so his group um, generated three new metrics. And one is uh, the light regularity index. The way it works is very similar to the, the SRI. So we have data of uh, you have light profiles. Um, continuously throughout 24 hours over several days. And basically, there's just one added step. You need to introduce a threshold. Um, because, you know, with sleep and wakefulness, you, have, you can either be asleep or awake. So that gives you a binary state, either or. And you need the same for light exposure. And with a threshold, if the light level is below the threshold, you can assign a zero. If it's above, you assign a one, and that creates the binary time series. And with that, you can then do the same and just compare the light pattern on one day to the next, and so on for the whole period. And that is then uh, integrated, again, into a score between zero random light pattern and 100 perfectly regular light pattern. And what they find is pretty similar to our findings. The more regular sleep, the more regular the light exposure. So there's like a positive association. And that, uh, well, really, you know, raises the question, if they are so closely related, which contributes to circadian disruption? Because they can do that independently from each other. They can both affect the circadian system and can both consequently drive health risks or effects. Um, and so that brings me to the last part, where based, like, based on all what we know already, what is, um, where are the gaps? And one of the big gaps is uh, the mechanism, right? So we need to study more variability in these other rhythms, like light, exercise, meal timing. Um, and for that, we probably need new metrics, or at least uh, slightly modified ones we have. But we also need to separate these co-occurring rhythms. And that can only be done experimentally in the lab. And it hasn't been so far, no study. So that's really where you can <laughs> make a name for yourself. Um, the other big area for future research are um, prospective studies. So right now, a lot of the, the evidence that we have is based on cross-sectional studies. Basically, you have, well, if you're an irregular sleeper right now, um, are you also likely to have high blood pressure or suffer from diabetes? But what we really want to know is if you measure sleep at time point one, does that predict the onset of an illness at time point two? Is it sort of causal for adverse uh, health outcomes? And that is closely related to a question I also get a lot. If some variability in sleep is natural, right? No one sleeps, you know, identically every day. What then is a healthy level of sleep variability? What is too much? What is too irregular and what is still okay? And so the, that question really, or the answer really involves two aspects. And one has been done already, again, by... Um, Andrew's group, Dan Windred, uh, uh, his PhD student. So they took the sample from the UK Biobank and it just characterized or calculated SRI in that sample in a population of more than 60,000 people. And you see that the SRI in that cohort is near normally distributed. You have a median value of about an SRI of 80. So 50% are above that, 50% are below that. And uh, here are some example sleep patterns. And you can see that to really reach these low SRI values, um, usually there's some sort of naps or awakenings or sleep fragmentation involved. Otherwise, you, you can't really get to these low SRI scores, so to a lot of irregularity with just consolidated sleep. And so that's the first step. But then we need to ask, you know, um, a dose response relationship. 
is it already too irregular if you're here in that light bluish region or for in order to have increased health risk would you need to be more in that red yellow and orange region where a lot of fragmentation is going on and that's really an unanswered question by now then um, of course these are sort of the, the consequences of irregular sleep what about the factors that contribute to irregular sleep that make people sleep irregularly and uh, that can be an environmental factor right so an imposed shift work schedule for example but it could also come from within a person and be endogenous a physiological factor like the sensitivity to light and we've done a bit of research into um into these two aspects and we used a, a mathematical model for that so we uh, simulate uh, sleep wake patterns using uh, a model and there's a quite a well documented relationship between a late chronotype and irregular sleep that's what you usually find so if people um have day work and um, in the model, we simulated a start time of 7 a.m., right? That's where you have to start working. Then what we and empirical studies find is later chronotypes ha uh, have more irregular sleep. And uh, within day work, there's really not much we can do. So it doesn't matter if, uh, you know, when day work starts within the constraints of what still qualifies at day work, late chronotypes are always more irregular. That changes in shift work. So. Uh, here we simulated a, um, a three shift schedule so we had the morning shift afternoon and night shift uh, that's typical in the industry um, also typical start time is 6 a.m for the morning shift and we find the same relationship although attenuated but it's still there however if we now come up with crazy schedules and we I tend to humanize the model so in 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 my world the model goes to work and if the model if I, if I make the model go to work at 2 a.m., that's where the morning star, uh, shift starts. Then we can reverse the relationship. And now later chronotypes are actually more regular sleepers, both compared with themselves, as well as compared with earlier chronotypes. So it's not something intrinsic to late chronotypes. It's an interaction with their work schedule. But in all fairness, the way our, way, the, the way our world works the way it's structured we're still diurnal that does not favor late chronotypes so in most circumstances that are realistic late chronotypes will most likely have more irregular sleep and then we also looked at um, a physiological factor so you can imagine if you're so so individuals differ with regards to how sensitive they react to light how sensitive their circadian system reacts to light you can imagine that if you're very sensitive then that light might bump you around a bit or more and result in irregular sleep patterns. So again, we used a mathematical model that is based on physiology. So involves, it involves parameters that reflect how the light signal is processed in the eye before it's passed on to the master clock in the brain. And we can vary these parameters, right? We can make the model more or less sensitive, and then we can simulate sleep wake patterns and see if that affects sleep regularity and so one like uh, two of these parameters um, relate to the intensity of uh, the sleep exposure and the timing so the intensity is summarized in those response curves the more light you give the bigger the response you get from the circadian system and we can make the system by like in the in the model by changing the parameter we can make it more or less sensitive and that means to produce the same response we now need much less light that's more sensitive or much more light so that's less sensitive and the same goes for the timing so the effect that light has on the circadian clock depends on the timing of the light stimulus so light in the morning advances the clock light in the evening delays it and we can make the model more or less sensitive to evening light by changing this parameter. So to make this uh, quite quick, uh, yes. So three out of these five light parameters did affect sleep regularity, including uh, these two that I just presented. So indeed, if individuals 
differ in how sensitive they are to light that at least based on the model can produce more or less irregular sleep wake patterns and that's really i think a promising starting point to now go you know into the field into the lab and see what we find empirically all right let me just okay um okay and then the last point or avenue that i think is really um still unanswered but promising do we see any sex differences uh, both with regards to you know promoting factors do males and females differ in um in you know how regular or irregular they are and where that's where that comes from but also are the consequences of irregular sleep different are um, males or females affected um, more by irregular sleep and uh, just also the, the last quick excursion, that is, uh, again, data from the college student uh, study, where we saw that irregular sleep was associated with poorer well-being, but that effect was really driven by male students and not by female students. It wasn't the case that females and males differed in how irregular their sleep was. There was, you know, more or less the same but given the same level of irregularity male students reported feeling uh, worse than female students and we don't know why that is okay so i want to leave you with this outlook um, with these open questions i want to encourage you to get into the field i think it's um it's super interesting and exciting very promising there's still a lot to cover and if you're interested to use these new metrics, SRICPD, then both Andrew and I promise uh, that we get back to you within 24 hours. And that's our thing now. And with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and, of course, you for listening. And again, Manuel, for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs>